How are you this morning? Now, one of the things we have to get used to as a pastor and congregation is that I like to talk to you and I'd like for you to talk back. Let's practice it together. How are you? That, did that hurt? That, that wasn't bad, was it? Okay. All right. That's good. Um, there is another tradition that I've grown up with. If you hear something in the sermon that, that particularly you, you appreciate, you can say, Amen. Let's just practice that together. Amen. How are we getting there? What a fool believes. Lord, as we open your word now, speak to us, change us, and challenge us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you could turn the gain down just a bit on my mic, that would be helpful. One of the greatest mysteries that we see in life today is how the brain actually works. Scientists tell us that we only use about 10% of our brain's capacity. And on the freeway this morning, I'm now convinced that we probably use a lot less than 10%. But what's more of interest to me is how the world views a faithful believer, you and I. You see, if you believe in the literal promises of God, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was born and and died on the cross and rose on the third day and will come again soon to this earth, the world will consider you naive, stupid, and perhaps a misguided fool. But it gets worse. Recently, a research study appeared in the journal Neuropsychologica. And this research study purported that religious fundamentalism is in part the result of functional impairment in the brain region known as the prefrontal cortex. When I went to this journal uh, over this week, there are now dozens of articles, research being done by psychologists and psychiatrists that basically suggest that there's something wrong with people who believe. The study suggested that Damage to this area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, affects our ability to be flexible and open. And so because they see us as inflexible and not open to new things, they think that we must have had something wrong with our brain. Dr. Gordon Grafman of Northwestern University described this study. He did it with veterans of Vietnam War who had brain trauma, and he basically felt that brain trauma made them vulnerable to religious fundamentalism. So basically, the world thinks that you've got to be brain damaged to believe in the Bible. This so-called science that we see in articles like this kind of helps people in the world come to the conclusion that we are just plain brain damaged fools. So what does the Bible tell us? Let's look at our scripture reading for today. Now, one habit I want to make sure everybody develops is to bring your Bible to church. Because I'm old school. What happens if the, if the screen fails? What will you do? You'll be just forlorn, lost. You'll be in tears. But if you bring your Bibles with you, yeah, I see Bibles. Hold your Bibles up. Let's just try that. Amen. Hold your phones up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 21, let's get busy. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. Verse 27, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Here Paul affirms that essentially God made a conscious decision to appear foolish to the world. In fact, the truth about God will always appear foolish to those who don't believe. Now, of interest is verse 23. It says, for believers 
The crucified Christ may be a stumbling block, and for unbelievers, foolishness. We stumble over the gospel, they laugh at the gospel, but neither is an appropriate end. Yes, even though we know better, even church members still sometimes stumble over Christ. Somehow we keep missing the point. We too get our thinking twisted. We too can fall prey to rationalization and embarrassment and misguided notions of what God is really all about. So we lift up holy hands from unholy hearts. We cohabitate before marriage because we think we need to have a test drive. We argue religion from Bibles that we don't read. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things of the wise. What we believe is supposed to somehow seem foolish to the world, and there's a good reason for it. It's in our next passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. To discern, they must be born of the Spirit. You cannot discern what God is saying unless God gives you his Spirit so you can understand what he's saying. Debate does not work. This is why I don't get into arguments with people who don't believe what I believe, because you can't win them over by arguing with them. You need to pray for them that the Holy Spirit will open their eyes and they can see. And I'll tell you a bit more about why that's so important in a minute. You see, the mind that is not spiritually aware or spirit empowered cannot comprehend the things of God. Ultimate truth requires ultimate discernment. The unspiritual cannot understand spiritual things any easier than I could grow hair. Some of you may think I was born bald. Well, I probably was. But I made a decision one day to become bald. You say, why would you do such a silly thing like that? Well, as a young physician in practice, as many doctors in here will testify, I was cheap. So I gave myself my own haircuts. You know where this is going, don't you? My clipper had a little guide comb on it so that my afro would be neat. Y'all remember afros? Yeah, I had one. And one day while I was shaving my, or at least trying to cut my hair, the guide comb fell off in mid-stroke. And I had this neat one and a half inch furrow down the back of my head. But being a physician and a minister, I knew not to panic. So I just put the lowest comb on the clipper and I thought I would just shave it all down close. This is a cut that back when I was a child they used to call a quo vadis. It came out of a movie that was called by the same title. And you saw a lot of African-American men wearing their hair very close to their heads. It was a quo vadis style. I thought I'd get a quo vadis. Only to discover that underneath my afro there was an ugly balding process that had already begun in spots. But I was brave. I went to my office. My assistants came out and saw me. And when they were resuscitated from laughing, <laughs> they told me, you, you need to go back home. Don't even come into this office looking like you're looking today. So that night, my wife was out of town. I shaved my head for the first time. She came back in and thought, you know, I'd been on chemo or something over the day. Um, and there I was, a bald guy. But I had the best of hopes to grow it back once I took a vacation. But then I got a job in television, bald. The job lasted three and a half years, so I had to stay bald. By that time, I actually got comfortable being bald. And so that's why I am. So my, my chances of growing hair are not great, but anybody without the Spirit, their chances of understanding what God's Word is saying is also not great. 
We all need the Spirit of God to understand what God is trying to tell us. So what's really going on with the world? You may have noticed that the world seems a little crazy, that people don't seem to have any civility any longer, that the whole place seems like it's messed up. Well, I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to read it to you first. I'll read you the first sentence, and I'll put it up on the screen. For thousands of years, and I'm reading from Second Selected Messages, page 352, for thousands of years, Satan has been experimenting on the properties of the human mind, and he has learned to know it well. Now let that just marinate for a minute. Thousands of years, the devil has been experimenting with our brains, and he knows them very, very well. I'm going to let you finish this with me. By his subtle workings in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own. Pause. That word linking is critically important. The devil is linking his mind with the minds of people, imbuing it with his thoughts. And he is doing this work in so deceptive a manner that those who accept his guidance know not that they are being led by his will and at his will. Led by him and at his will. So there's a physiological process that's going on. Half-brained and foolish notions dominate the thinking of the world and these half brain notions are directed by Satan himself connecting his brain with ours. Is that sobering to you? But it does begin to explain what we see on the nightly news. It does begin to explain what we hear on our radios and what we read in magazines because people are now linked up unknowingly to satanic forces and the thoughts of the devil are being placed into the minds of people. Satan has been mind melding with humankind seeking to control our thoughts and this really is what fake news is all about. Our minds are being communicated to by the devil. The world, you see, is deceived. And that's what we're dealing with, is deception. So when you try to have a conversation at work or a conversation um, at your gym or any place you go with people about what it is you believe, the reason they have such a hard time understanding some of where you're coming from is because they've been simply deceived and their brain has been linked up with the demonic forces of evil. So let's just figure out for a minute, just what does a fool believe? I'll give you a short list. First of all, a fool believes that there is no God. It came straight out of scripture. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So. The first group of fools that you're going to meet on the world are people who don't even believe that there is a God. Secondly, fools believe that science trumps revelation. Fools also believe that they have time on their side. You ever heard people say, oh, I got plenty of time. I don't have to do anything about my life, my spirit, because I got time. I'm young. I had time. I've lost quite a bit of it now along with my hair. But sometimes the young people think they have all the time they need. Fools think that the coming of Jesus has been delayed so long that it now has become irrelevant. And there are people in the church who no longer think that it's relevant for us to talk about the second coming of Jesus because it's been delayed. And so they think, well, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. It won't happen in your lifetime. So why are you preaching it? A fool also believes that the church has so many hypocrites in it that the noble thing to do is to withdraw from worship so that you're not contaminated by hypocrites. By the way, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is somebody who says one thing, 
and does another, who has high and lofty intentions, but their lives actually fall below what it is they say. You should know that we all are hypocrites. I know that came as a shock. Because none of us are able to accomplish what it is we say. We all are human. The best place for a hypocrite to be is among friends, in church. This is where hypocrites receive spiritual care. This is where we grow. This is where we overcome. This is where we find the strength to actually make our lives come to harmony with what we say and what God has called us to do. But I'm not, I'm not concerned about hip hypocrisy. Were it not for hypocrisy, we wouldn't have a church membership. Because God is working on us. Fools also believe, which is very interesting, that Jesus can't be the only way. They look at all the religions in the world, Buddha, they read the Bhagavad Gita, they look at Muhammad, they say, how can Jesus be the only way? So a fool believes that that can't be true. When Jesus makes it very clear, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way. A fool also believes that personal opinions are more important than scripture. Perhaps the most deadly words to be spoken by church members is, I know the Bible says so-and-so, but I think. Did it ever occur to you that God may not be impressed with what you think? I'm just asking the question. I'm just saying. That God may actually be more impressed with those who do what he said do rather than form their own opinions about what they will or will not do. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three and four. But even if our gospel is veiled, and by the way, to, to, the, um, to the lost, it is veiled. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. So we're dealing with people whose minds have been blinded, whose eyes have been blinded by the devil himself. That's why they can't see the truth of the word. The good news, after all this bad news, is that there is an antidote to mind-melding activities of the devil. There is a solution. Here's the antidote. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. And 1 Corinthians 2, 16. We have the mind of Christ. We need the mind of Jesus. And he desires to imbue our thoughts with his thoughts. So he's directly counteracting what the devil is trying to do. Jesus wants to put his thoughts into our minds. He speaks to our minds primarily through his word. That sometimes we find a hard time opening up and reading. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. We need to have our minds renewed. Because if our minds are renewed, we can finally come to the place where we can prove for ourselves, not necessarily to others, prove for ourselves what is the will of God. And then there's the issue of our thoughts. Messages to Young People, page 76. You are responsible to God for your thoughts. Just sitting around letting your mind run in idle, you're still responsible for everything you think. In fact, Jesus made it very clear that people may look at a woman and lust after her, just as, and that's just as bad as actually having a relationship outside of your, your marriage. So 
your thoughts are going to be judged by God. And we're responsible for those thoughts. So an unrenewed mind is just too carnal to grasp the truth and too weak to defend oneself against deception. But a renewed mind is capable of proving the perfect will of God. So this is a binary choice. Who is controlling your thought? It's either the Lord or it's the devil. There is no third option. And you will have to decide who you're going to allow to control your mind. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Very familiar passage to us all. We walk by faith and not by sight. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now embarked on what is called the sightless walk. It is the most difficult to defend and sometimes the most difficult to maintain. This walk with God where we can't see exactly what's going on. So let me give you an example of what I mean by how difficult this could be. So you serve an unseen God doing battle against an invisible devil looking forward to a heavenly city with a Jesus who allegedly rose from the dead, living in a nation that you prophesy from your scriptures is going to speak like a dragon and persecute every one of us one day, going to a church on the wrong day of the week, and you don't dance, you don't drink, and you don't fornicate. What could go wrong? Why would anybody think that you're not a fool? Because that's what we believe. And that's why people look at us and say, this is foolish. Because the life that we live and the things we believe to the world whose minds have been linked to the devil cannot appreciate anything about what we do. And our problem is that we sometimes believe what the world believes. And we begin to look at ourselves as foolish. And so you begin to believe that you're wiser than the average bear because you don't fall for all of the stuff that we believe. And so you begin to pick and choose. Yeah, I, I accept the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is not the only day I could worship. And God doesn't really require that I come to church every week. Or you begin to, to make decisions about what you eat or what you wear or what you listen to or what you read because you're wiser than what the Word says. And then we find ourselves going down this slippery slope that the Bible calls foolishness. Christ will never remove all reason for doubt. From the book True Education, but God has given in the scriptures sufficient evidence of their divine authority. True, he has not removed the possibility of doubt. Faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt have opportunity, but those who desire to know the truth find ample ground for faith. Faith must rest upon the evidence. And then Paul adds to this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Essentially, the, re the renewed mind trusts in the evidence of faith. Faith becomes my evidence. And because I trust God, no matter what the world says, no matter what my eyes even may see, I still trust what God says. We recognize there are things coming before us, satanically devised, that will deceive you. What will you do when your grandmother suddenly appears, who's been dead for 50 years, and begins to talk to you? Will your eyes believe what your faith tells you is not true? Because the devil is going to try to deceive us. Without the miracle of grace, the world will remain imprisoned by this mind-melding activity of the devil. So, 
It's time for saints to wise up. That's you and that's I. We have to wise up. We can't afford to be foolish. Now, I'm not afraid of being called a fool. Because I've read some things in Scripture that make me feel pretty comfortable about it. You know, the three Hebrew boys who were thrown into the fiery furnace were probably thought to be pretty foolish. You've heard that story. When, the, when everyone was asked to bow down to the golden image, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I suspect, were not the only Israelites in the crowd. But all the wise folk bowed down. Can't you see a couple of the Israelites trying to communicate with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Psst, psst, get down, get down. And they were probably saying to themselves, boy, those are some fools, because they, they're about to get jacked up. They did. But they had air conditioning in the fiery furnace because they trusted in the Lord. Did I hear an amen? Lord, have mercy. Check your pulse. Daniel had to be considered foolish for praying with his window open. All Daniel had to do was close his windows. But Daniel said, I always keep my window open. I'm not closing my windows because you made some decree. So they take Daniel and they throw him where? In a lion's den. And what, is ha what happens to Daniel because of his faith? He turns a hungry lion into a pillow and sleeps through the night. But the story of fools that is the most impressive to me is Joshua and Jericho. Perhaps the worst, most foolish battle plan in the history of military exploits. And I'm a former soldier. So I have in my mind that Joshua has to tell his generals what the plan of battle is. It's called a briefing. So like I'm standing before you now, Jericho, Joshua is probably standing in front of his generals. And one of his generals says, excuse me, uh, brother Joshua, what's the plan? So Joshua is thinking for a minute because he says, when I tell them what God just told me, they're going to think I'm an absolute lunatic. But he goes ahead. Okay, so uh, today, uh, I want everybody to line up in a nice line. Let's put the horns out there, put the priests out there. We're going to walk around Jericho once. And then we're going to come back here and kick it until tomorrow. And so you can imagine the, the generals are starting to look at Joshua like, okay, this is really, what? He said, and then we're going to do the same thing tomorrow. And for six straight days, just going to walk around at once and then we're going to come back and chill. But on the seventh day, we're going to do something really special. We're going to walk around it seven times. And then we're going to blow our trumpets and we're going to shout. And then the wall is just going to fall down. Now about this time, I'm sure there's a general, a captain, somebody out there is hunching his, said, you know, he's lost it. You realize he... He had it, but I, you know, I don't know, since Moses died, I, I, he, you know, he doesn't have it. They looked absolutely ridiculous. But as you read the story, after the seventh time around, what happened? Walls fell. Ladies and gentlemen, through faith, the walls in your life fall. Habits crumble. Addictions melt away. If you have faith in God, you might be considered foolish by some, but you're not. Then on the cross, as Jesus was suspended in air, they began to mock him. They said, others he saved. Himself, he cannot say. But I hear in the background wisdom shouting out, saying, but with his stripes, we are healed. If he had not saved himself, 
we would be lost. So in the foolishness of God's plan, we find salvation. So as I close, don't be a fool. Because who knows what a fool believes, but we do know the reward of foolishness. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Then my final scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. We see through a mirror dimly. Our vision is so imperfect. Even when we try to size up each other, we don't really have ultimate knowledge. But one day we're going to see God face to face. Right now all we can do is read about him. That day we'll talk to him. Face to face. This sightless walk of faith will one day be rewarded. What the church needs today is mind renewal. We need renewed minds. Minds that can resist the deception. Minds that are impervious to mind-melding activity of the devil. Minds that think the thoughts of Jesus. Bow your heads with me. There may be someone here right now who recognizes that You've been thinking foolish thoughts. You didn't know that you were being manipulated by satanic forces. But you want to ask God to do something special for your mind, special for your life. You want to be renewed. With every head bowed now and every eye closed, I want to pray for those who are seeking renewal. If that is your prayer, just raise your hand and say, Lord, Renew me. Just renew me. Lord and Father, you see our hands. We seek renewal. We seek to be remade. We want to please you because we love you because you first loved us. And we don't want to be deceived and manipulated by Satan and his ideas and the world and its ideas. While we may look like fools to some, May we understand that God uses the foolishness of the world to shame the wise. May we trust. May we obey. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn together. Face to face with Jesus.